from school for the summer with me and I'm yeah. I've been running b between two places myself so oh my goodness I, I definitely know how that is so you know trying to get ready for a show and everything it's hectic yeah yeah do you have kids Nathaniel no I have dogs so you have dogs? kind of the same I have dogs thing too. yeah <laughs> I wouldn't call myself a dog daddy like some people do you know what I mean I'm a dog mom yeah that's a little they're, they're odd kind of, right <laughs> it always was for me I'm like what the, what the heck are you talking about <laughs> You didn't birth them things, That's but funny. um, yeah, yeah, I'm excited. It's uh, it's always great to be on a new show. Good, good. I'm excited too. I've got a, a few people waiting, and yeah. they're excited to tune in in great, the chat great. box and whatnot. I was um, did you want to do? I have your bio. I was going to introduce mm -hmm. you and then ask you an initial question, asking you about your personal experiences and what led you into right. this. And then I was just going to let it kind of unfurl from there. That's fine. That, that works okay. for me, whatever you want to do. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. So let me do a few last minute tie ups here. Okay. Hmm. I thought you were going to wear your hat. <laughs> I like no, that. Picture. I have. Uh... Yeah, I'm a big hat guy, you know, because my hair is wacky anyway. I have like three or four different cowlicks on one side. Oh. And so I'm like, I'm telling you, if you've watched any of my shows, that's why. Like if I have a bad hair day, the hat's going to be on. So, uh, you know, today it's looking a little bit better. Thank God. <laughs> well, it's great for your image. I have cowlicks too. That's why I keep my hair all one length and long because otherwise them cowlicks, they start to show up. Yeah. <laughs> no doubt. It's much easier. That's funny. Okay, so right. I've been using this other streaming software that I'm no longer yep. happy with. So I'm just gonna be streaming it straight from Zoom. So bear with me while I figure this okay. out. Mm. Trust me, I've, I've seen people, uh, I've done hundreds of shows and I've seen people, you know, try to figure out, especially new systems, you know, or you know, yeah. new ways of broadcasting. Yeah, so no worries. Yeah, I was using a, a service called OneStream and I loved the concept and theory. It was great because it would stream mm -hmm. into multiple places at once, but there were always like hiccups and like it would <sighs> mess up the video quality. And I'm just like, hey, this is mm -hmm. not worth it. Yeah, I, um, all right. I did a show for four, a four hour long show. And uh, when oh we were goodness. done, it wasn't even recorded one time. Yeah. Oh Lord! Oh no! Four oh, hours. My goodness, no. Yeah, I was like, "Oops." Oh, there are some of my best friends in the world, oh, and I was like, "Thank no. God," you know. But whatever. Yeah, I was like, "Oops." Oh, there are some of my best friends in the world, and I was. I'm hearing an echo. Do you hear an echo at all? All right, I believe we're live, and the echo okay. is gone. Awesome! Awesome! Cool beans! Cool beans! Hi, Nathaniel. It's so good hello. to have you live with me today. How are you, sir? I am doing well. I'm very excited to be with you and, and yours and uh, get into my research. And like I said before, it's always a pleasure being on a new show so, and meeting new people. I first saw you on Leak Project when you were hosting for Rex. And right. I, I really loved your style. I was tapping into your energy in real time there. And I was like, man, I got to reach out to this guy because <laughs> he's got some like differing viewpoints than me, but I'm like real interested. I'm like leaning in and I want to know sure. more. So you have a background in demonology. Is this correct? correct. That is, yes, it is correct. Absolutely. Um, so I'm. it says here that you are, you're an author and the name of your book, The Skin That Crawls, that kind of makes my skin crawl, just saying that, I love it. And mm -hmm. I we're going to plug that link in here for everyone who is interested in learning more about all of your research and your personal experience, because it's, it says here that you used to live in a haunted house and that you right. spent 20 years researching what you encountered there. Do you want to? I, I want to know more about this. Can you just like give us the scoop here? Yeah. So when I was eight years old, my family moved into a new house. And uh, at the open house, actually, uh, I was kind of looking around at my, my future room, trying to figure out where I was going to place my gaming system and 
my clothes and all that. And uh, I was led for some reason, can't tell you why to this day, but I was led to get on my hands and knees and look underneath the bed that was in the corner of the room. And when I did, there was a, a beautiful little girl. She may have been about six years old, very pale complexion, long black hair, and uh, just beautiful. I thought I, at that age, I'm, I'm eight years old. So I'm thinking, okay, I got a friend, you know, I don't know anybody else around this neighborhood. I'm new. So I, I originally thought that somebody had snuck in to the open house. You know, the family that owned it was gone. It was just the realtor. The doors were unlocked. So I thought she was a neighborhood girl. Uh, but when I, when I first looked at her, we kind of looked at each other. I shrieked and I, I kind of jumped back surprised. And uh, she shimmied herself all the way back to the wall. You say so, shimmied? The word shimmied, was shimmied? Just, yeah, yeah, shimmied. she just shimmied, moved herself. Yeah, it was very strange. And uh, I can still remember while I'm looking at her, there was a pervasive stench in the room. It smelled like, it smelled like sulfur. And it was disturbing, you know, because there was, there was nothing in the room itself other than a bed. There was no, you know, there was no, uh, you know, Chester drawers or the closet itself was even empty. But I remember smelling that. And, and once we got back into the car on the way home, I asked my parents, I said, is this family that owns this house, or, do they have any kids? They said, no, they were an elderly couple that died. Their kids are all grown. And I'm thinking, what's going on here, you know? So once we actually moved into that home, the entity mutated. So that wasn't a real little girl. It was an apparition of an entity that was trying to gain my trust and to manipulate my innocence. And so uh, as the years went on, the entity manifested to me as an old witch, uh, shadow figure, a dark cloud that would just hover in the corner of the room at nighttime. And so I, I encountered whatever this phenomenon is at a very young age. And I tell people, you know, it's, it's true, obviously, that that was instrumental in inspiring to become who I am and to research whatever phenomenon we're doing. Mm. So tell me, a, let, let's dive a little deep here, Nathaniel, you've piqued right. my interest. It's interesting that you say that there was a stench in the room that was mm -hmm. almost, I call these breadcrumbs. These are, are little, uh, they're, they're nuanced uh, hints for mm -hmm. us to follow from an extrasensory perspective. This is how I right. see these kinds of sprinklings of, you know, that if, if this was an actual apparition, like a, a, a ghostly figure, a, a transitioned spirit, or even mm -hmm. um, some other kind of entity that did not necessarily mean you harm from some of those lower dimensional realms, that mm -hmm. would, do you believe that would have been present in the room with you? I don't know. I think that uh, when we're dealing with this phenomenon, it has masked itself throughout history as everything we could possibly imagine. I'm not just saying that from my research, from that perspective, but actual case studies I've worked on, you know, in my own field. Um, so the phenomenon can mask itself as angels, guides, Jesus, Muhammad. Mickey Mouse, I've had, I've had cases where Mickey Mouse abducted kids. I mean, so, so whatever we're dealing with, uh, it is a way of veiling itself in order to deceive us. So uh, I want to make sure I answered your question. What do you mean by that? Because I don't want to dodge it. What do you mean by yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think I'm, I, I was being purposely obscure because right. I, I have myself encountered um, a myriad of different entities from mm -hmm many for from many different perspectives many different times in my life that I was it was very different each and every right. time and some one such time when I was a little girl I encountered uh, something very similar to what you described as a witch and it was in the dreamscape and I was walking out into my living room and I did not know I was asleep because everything looked real, everything looked in place, but there was a figure in the living room. And yet, as I came closer, there was this, this palpable feeling that this was not someone that I wanted to get any closer to. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and I couldn't no, no. have been more than three or four years old. I knew though, this was not my mom, this was not my dad. And then I kind of became somewhat aware that this was maybe not even my living room. 
even though it looked yeah. like it was right right and Absolutely. once it, it there was almost this sudden realization as soon as i realized that her gig her jig was up Mm -hmm. she turned around and like showed her true colors in that moment yes. it was like 100%. she was she was found out there was no sense in pretending anymore and mm -hmm. it was terrifying it was it was horrible and it took me some time to recover from from that experience i will say though that there have been other times that i have encountered um I, I and I'll, I don't even want to call it an entity. It's more mm -hmm. of like a communication from a okay. different realm. I'll I'll just come out and say that my brother he he transitioned in 2015. He took his own life, and mm -hmm. that was a very difficult time for me and my family. And we were raised in an in an agnostic slash atheist household. We didn't have any belief system that kind of carried us through this uh, transition ourselves, right? But mm -hmm. I will say that I have received a multitude of messages from him from the mm -hmm. other side. But I believe what you're saying is that oftentimes these entities will masquerade as our past loved ones. And that's actually what made me tune in to that right. interview that you were conducting uh, with uh, on Leak Project where you were divulging that information that there are people that have been hoodwinked by these entities right. yeah it's a terrifying reality we live in uh but the case studies evidence that fact that i mean like ted rice was a famous psychic he was a spiritual healer and uh for for decades he thought that his guide was his deceased mother mm -hmm. and so he's getting these messages and as accurate as many of them were because that's the litmus test, right? That's it. Well, if they're right, if they're right and that means that, you know, this entity is actually who it tells me it is, uh, which is not very true. You know, we're, we'll get into that here in a little bit. But yeah, and so for, for 26 years, he's, he's getting messages and, and until that entity asked him to do something that went against his mother's religious creed, that's when he started asking the relevant questions. Wait a minute. And then he went back through the years and said, okay, well, you know, now it makes sense as to why they were, it was almost like they were playing the long games. They were building trust, right? Mm -hmm. Manipulating innocence and manipulating truthfully the human condition to want to understand the beyond and to connect to, to loved ones. Now, that's not to say that real entities or in terms of ghosts don't exist. They absolutely exist. Uh, but there is a secondary uh, being out there that has the knowledge, the evidential interest, and the ability to to masquerade as deceased loved ones and be deceased mm. in order to deceive us uh ted rice the same psychic um when he was eight years old his deceased grandfather appeared to him in his room at nighttime and he thought for sure that you know of course the human condition i've missed you i love you you know how have you been what's what's the afterlife uh, like and everything and um his uh, grandfather assaulted him or tried to oh wow and so it, it got real quick and so he's he's running out of his room and as he did the entity moved out of the room started chasing him but when he chased him chased him he, he transformed its apparition and it was a reptilian being it wasn't even his grandfather and it was just mm. something that was masquerading uh, we have case studies in ufo abduction where uh, there's one case that I wrote, a 12 year old girl wakes up in the middle of the night and she wakes up because she hears what she thinks is her mother calling her name. Come out here, mm. come out here to the living room. And so, of course, she's young and innocent and has absolutely not prepared for what she's about to deal with. And uh, so she walks out into the hallway and she looks into the bathroom. All the lights are off. Her eyes adjust to the darkness. Both of her parents are in suspended animation. Their mouths aren't moving. But again, she hears the voice of her mother. That's mm -hmm. when she turns into the living room and in the shadows, there was an entity. And that was who was calling her out. So what I've learned in my research is that a lot of times, not only are these candies beings uh, masquerade as ghosts, but they do so in order to bait us, to invite us in. And there is a measure of what I call a protocol of belief 
where once we believe they are who they say they are, then there is a measure of um, permission or what I call permissive will, where now that entity has latched on, right? Mm -hmm. Now I have authority because you believe who I say I am. So there's a game being played on both ends. And what we're, not just me, but I and my colleagues in the field, we're, we're trying to understand is what are the rules to this game? Very interesting. The, mm-hmm. So this protocol of belief that you have defined, I, I really love this. It mm-hmm. is, um, I, I guess what it conjures up in, in my mind's eye field of vision here is this need for a discerning criteria, right? Well, yeah. That we are, yeah, like like you said, there's there's a lot going on out there outside of this spectrum of visible light that mm-hmm. we human avatars on Earth are privy to in this 3D world, and wow. that we but we are getting little tricklings into like from the ether. And Mm -hmm. as we open up more of our intuitive extrasensory abilities, which I absolutely believe that we are doing as a collective, more Mm -hmm. is flowing through. It's almost like we're turning the faucet on a bit higher, right? Correct, correct. But what what you were talking about, tell me, it's a protocol of... Belief. Protocol of belief. Okay, so... Right. How many differing kinds of entities would you say from your research are we encountering from beyond the veil? I don't think we know yet. I think that, see, I'm a proponent of what's called the unified field theory. I think that all of these negative entities uh, are, are coming from the same source. Hmm. I think so. So people would like like the number one question i'm often asked when shows okay do you believe they're aliens or demons i believe they're neither right right Right. i believe these are masks and that something else is in the shadows that is manipulating us based upon our belief systems our perceptions of it and you know so it's is it it demonic it's more than demonic because that term has certain attachments to it that limit that concept it has to be catholic if it's a demon that's one thing i've I've learned in my field right or or if it's alien it has to be extraterrestrial it can't be in a dimension Mm. and so what it's doing though is it's it's playing us it's it's gaslighting us into these two fields of research meanwhile the true phenomenon whatever it really is is hiding from us in the shadows Mm. yeah right manipulating both fields because if because watch this people that believe it's aliens do not believe it's demons and vice versa. If it's not demons, well, it has to be aliens. So they, they, they've not given themselves the intellectual ability to think beyond, right, to where they suggest, okay, possibly there's a third option here that we don't, we, we do not yet have the vocabulary for. Mm. So, so to answer, that. Yeah. So, so to answer your question, um, I don't, I can't tell you with a surety how many beings there are out there. I can only tell you how many masks it wears the knowledge it possesses and uh, the, the game it's playing. We're still, mm-hmm. again, we're still looking for rules, but uh, whatever is going on, deception plays a role. Gotcha. No, it does. I, I completely agree in, I, I don't ascribe to one um, facet of, of a belief system or the other. I think that mm-hmm. is kind of my gift in how I was raised in an atheistic household. I was mm-hmm. I was kind of born into this neutrality zone, right? Where, right. you know, this um, this train of thought, this spiritual philosophy, sure, it's interesting and it, it entices me. I want to know more, you know, but I don't ascribe to any one right. thing. And I think that gives me a level of discernment that others are, are, not, um, are not able to tap into because of the belief systems that they're conditioned into from early childhood. And Absolutely. that is, I, I think that I know that I have encountered or my family has encountered um, apparitions, um, transitioned loved ones that they did not know that they were necessarily in the room with us. And maybe you can uh, clear up what this term is, but it's mm-hmm. almost like it's a hologram 
that mm -hmm. is replaying almost like a recorded video over and over right. again in the same uh, space time parameter. And mm -hmm. then there's other kinds that are like departed souls that were tormented, either murdered or tortured or some other such uh, terrible lower dimensional frequency that held them, you know, harnessed here in this plane. And mm -hmm. they are interacting with us humans in real time, not like that recording. You know, these are different right. phenomenons, though they are both departed spirits departed um, right. transition souls um is right. this uh ringing true y yes it, it it does uh now you're talking about a recurring haunting where these things whatever you want to call them ghosts or apparitions or mutated evolved consciousness where they will they will manifest almost as a loop right at the same oh, time yeah. of the day right it yes. just goes over and over again now, um, there are cases that are deeply troubling because, you know, you'll have a family that moves in and the family that's moving out sits them down and says, okay, you know, we got to disclose some information before we sign this contract <laughs> here. There is a guy named Charlie that, you know, he, he, you know, he was murdered in the house. And so he only comes like on Wednesdays at 7.30 p.m. You'll hear his heavy footfall up the stairs and everything. And, and that's all well and great. <laughs> up until po the point that Charlie makes eye contact. Mm, okay where it stops being a loop right i see so there's a bridge that can there's be a bridge traveled between yeah. these two okay interesting yeah and so right it, it's the same uh, phenomenon we have with the poltergeist activity right in parapsychology where a poltergeist is just something that slams doors well what's happened uh, throughout history is we have many cases especially the, dr barry taff other parapsychologists steve mara where upon investigation, yes, there are doors that are slamming at night, uh, but that entity gets tired of slamming doors and now it's hovering over the wife at nighttime. Mm. So, so there's a certain amount of victimology that comes to the fore when these things get tired of not getting enough attention or, or if and when they want to execute their plan. Mm. And so that's, that's when both phenomena start to merge together and we realize that it's quite possible that what we've been calling, you know, um, a looping ghost is actually just, again, the phenomenon baiting people, wanting, wanting interaction. And when it doesn't get it again, it comes back. Does it, did it, you know, it's very interesting stuff. Um, but again, when it starts to, to manifest, and I'm going to say this, not to be demonetized, when it starts to manifest, especially sexual pathology, that's when you start to realize that there is something very ritualistic in the house. And now you have your hands full because it's never good. So that is a, you, you would say that that is a common denominator in some yeah. of the, in a lot of these occurrences. Right. 100%. Uh, matter of fact, Paul Eno in the Bridgeport Poltergeist case, it was in uh, Connecticut in the seventies. Uh, they had various poltergeist activities. I mean, you know, at one point he told me personally, he's like, Nathaniel has said the, the refrigerator levitated off of the ground and the police officers were freaking out. And so there were, there were a lot of manifestations there that we would consider to be poltergeist activity until four apparitional beings, single file line, moved out from the bedroom through the kitchen and squared up with Paulina. Hmm. That's not just a poltergeist, right? right? So we have both phenomena in one case. So, so I think that, uh, that especially in demonology, we need to reinvestigate and reconsider the data regarding poltergeists and even uh, recurring hauntings. What are they? Why are they? And is it possible it's just another trap caused by whatever these beings are? How intriguing we have some really active questions and folks <laughs> like in the chat here i'm going to read these off so that maybe you can help answer some of these some of these right. inquiries nathaniel so uh to answer your question isabella i think she hopped on right after we started yes he said that it did smell like sulfur in the room whenever yeah. he encountered this little girl that later showed her true colors. Is that right, Nathaniel? 
Yes. And if I can go into that area real quick, because I, I want to sure. answer that question, but I would like to answer it in depth. Now, according to my research, that's not a new phenomenon. That goes all the way back to Mesopotamian text, even in biblical antiquity. Now, their theory is very interesting because it fits with what we know in parapsychology. Um, they believe that the ghost will often bear the same stench that it corpse, corpse does. Mm. And so, in other words, the consciousness itself carries the same smell as the body it left. Now, when you get into Mesopotamian texts, Akkadian texts, even in biblical antiquity especially, they would consider that to be an unclean spirit. And so what they would perform are, are exorcistic rites. Number one, you want to get rid of the entity. And uh, anyways, but my point is that when I was experiencing that 100%, I was not just spelling, uh, smelling some, some uh, decomposing organic matter. That was consciousness. Hmm right and so it, it carried the same smell of the corpse that it left and so that was an ancient idea that even to this day we're trying to employ when trying when understanding what we're experiencing um but yeah the sulfuric smell uh smelling like a corpse and um yeah it's all the above gotcha so pink man michael says i've been comforted and held by something slash someone when i was scared as a child she mm -hmm. i think it was a she he puts in parentheses did not identify herself mm -hmm. and i can say the same is true for me in that mm -hmm. i so i i really do um resonate with one with one particular strain that you i'm going to pull out here to kind of just uh, magnify here nathaniel what you were saying is that these entities have an agenda to have us trust them. That is an essential, um, an essential uh, ingredient for them Correct. to do what they are going to do, what they intend to do. Correct. And it, so they need, we need to trust them. That's like a prerequisite. Now, what would you say of the instances, and Isabella brings up a really valid point here where she asked him, did you feel safe during that experience? So I feel like there's kind of like a, a split here. Like, did you feel safe? And then dot, 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 something else happened later after you were made to feel safe? Or in some instances, like I have encountered, I really do feel like I was enveloped in light and made to feel safe. And then I never encountered that again, which kind of, you know, if we're gathering evidence here speaks right. to me of, you know, not the same agenda. Would you agree? Well, not even the same being. I mean, when I was in my haunted house, I reached out to God and I had no idea what I was dealing with. Honestly, I was just a kid and mm. uh, something moved into that bathroom and that being just disappeared, it faded away, like somebody had turned the light on or something. So uh, I'm not suggesting that all of these beings are evil. I think there is a good side that is helping us fight them. Uh, but my focus as a demonologist, again, has been on negative entities. <laughs> Moving deeper into this, uh, there are case studies where these beings will make you feel loved. Yeah. I think that the one lady in the ufology, I won't name her obviously, uh, huge in ufology she said well it couldn't have been a demon because it made me feel good it made I, no, no, i'm sorry not even that it was worse than that she said it couldn't have been a demon because the individual was not afraid of it okay really and I, and it's very uh, a unique situation to find myself in because the data says that i mean okay for for instance, forget what it does to me. As long as I'm not afraid of it, it's not a demon, right? Think about that logic. And that's where we're at in the field. These are some of the best researchers saying this. As long as I wasn't intimidated by it, it could have been a demon. Now, that's not a very good test. Right. Because we have cases of people feeling safe and then blacking out. And then two, 10 years later, mm. having PTSD symptoms, they do memory regression and realize that they were sexually assaulted. Right. But I felt safe. Therefore, it couldn't have been a bad entity. That's not that's not the basis of which we test their uh, the origin and their plans for us. 
Uh, again, these beings have caused people on this. Oh, I won't go down that road. Uh, but they can project thoughts into us. They can take over consciousness. They can, you know, I've had cases of marriages that fell apart because the woman felt like she cheated on the husband mm. or it had, it had got her so emotionally worked up. And, right, I was safe, but what did they do to you? Or what did they make you do? So and I, anyways, I'll stop rambling. I tend to ramble sometimes. No, no. We're all on the edge of our seat. Um, we're really absorbing everything you're throwing down. I think you bring up a really um, interesting point in that just because they're made to feel safe in that moment, I think there's a lot of variables here that remain to be explored. A, what state of mind and level of consciousness what amount of deep work has that individual done on their own level of discernment in that state that they find themselves within of feeling protected or you know if they're i i think that it's interesting that um what uh, an image that's coming to mind is from the movie the matrix in what? doc uh what, what is it agent smith and yeah. how he can infiltrate any given human avatar at any given moment. I, it almost feels like that could be the case in these other alternate dimensions, possibly. Right. I don't know. Like, I don't know. But Mr. It's... Anderson. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's creepy. It really is. I think that, again, this, get, this gets back to what's called the simulation theory, uh, which is something that I've been exploring as of late. I mean, we're, we're dealing with what I consider to be the unified field of consciousness. Uh, these beings certainly demonstrate that. Uh, even in demonology and in ufology, uh, they, they know when certain people are going to die. They can simulate near-death experiences. Mm -hmm. They can simulate out-of-body experiences and trigger by location. Literally, by location where people, not you, but someone witnesses you in two places at once. Oh, wow. Right. And then there's one case, specific case that blow, it's always blows my mind where that individual knew she was in two places at once and people witnessed her in two places at once. Wow. So whatever we're dealing with is eclipsing the microcosm of demonology to the point where we struggle to even articulate who, what, where and when they are. And so we're literally groping in the darkness for answers. Hmm. You know, how, how, number one, how would they have that much access to us? Right. To, to, right to literally simulate a near-death experience to the point where these end of these beings creatures uh they could actually manifest an apparition that's wearing the clothes they died in wow yeah crazy Who had, <laughs> right so so you know in i it's so funny i was thinking about this the other day uh when you take your let's say you take your dog out outside right there's an outside to go to you are aware of what the outside is so when they're taking us there's an outside there and their knowledge of the outside is what we're struggling with how would they know uh there's one researcher uh, one researcher that was in seminary and uh, he was in the middle of an exorcism with his uh, his professors and one priest and in his mind, in his mind, he said, this is a bunch of baloney. I don't, this doesn't make any sense. I don't believe it. Well, the entity that had possessed that girl snapped to attention. And just to, uh, and just to prove a point, he said, the entity said, I was there when your father ended his life. And he said, I made him pull the trigger. Oh, wow. Oh, and I then, got chills up my, my spine on that one. Right. And that's very personal to me because that was one of the spirits I encountered in my youth was suicide. Mm -hmm. Very much so. I mean, I wrote it was bad. Um, but again, to have that kind of access. Right. And, and we don't. Here's the problem, though. We don't know if he's telling the truth. Now, what we know is the entity knew that secret. He may have pulled it from that individual. Right. Or he may have gathered it on his own cognition. But the point is to wield that against a young man. Right. Just to prove to him a point, it's, uh, it's sadistic. Right. 
And uh, so whatever we're dealing with, uh, they know things that they shouldn't know. They have, they have access to us as a species they should not have. And it's quite troubling. I know, I know even like in the evangelical research field, uh, these researchers are still struggling to quantify whatever these things are, right? Because again, what, what's happened is that in demonology, the field itself is usually dominated by the leading religious system. Mm-hmm. And right now it's Catholicism. Right. And this blueprint of demonology is not fitting into Catholicism because they, they, you know, the, one of the ways they've yielded power throughout the years, hundreds of years, is the fact that our rights work, our exorcisms work, our, our creed is right. It, yeah, up until these beings pull a crucifix off of the wall. Now, this is a fixed motif in the field. If that is a rule that they're supposed to play by, if that is a belief they're supposed to have faith in, then why are they completely disregarding? Right. That's very interesting because I remember my magic and ritual and religion class at, here at Texas mm-hmm. State. I, I have an anthropology degree and that was one of my favorite classes. And I remember going over the um all about the possessions and we saw all of the films of all of the cases that were you know extreme cases and there was a criteria that the catholic church adhered to when determining whether or not this is a true possession or if this is you know just a mentally ill individual that doesn't fit that criteria and one of those criteria is exactly what you're describing in that they know things that they shouldn't. This person knows things that they shouldn't know. And that is what, you know, that's usually when the family ends up saying, okay, we need some extra help because this is not my daughter. This is not my husband. This is not, this is something else, you know? Something something alien to us even. Mm -hmm. There's something, right, there's something in my son. And in my book, The Skin That Crawls, I talk about fleshly eyes with ghostly vision. Hmm. Right? Like to where actual the, human beings walking amongst us. Uh, that but with the consciousness flesh? that's looking through their eyes. Okay. There's something, right? And even when you get into uh, serial killer pathologies, it's almost like when you're like interviewing them, sometimes the being will look around just to make eye contact. <laughs> I don't know why right. that's delightful. I, I know that sounds sick and terrifying. It's crazy. It's crazy, yeah. really, when you think about it, because like, oh yeah. So so there is something that's invading us with the impossible. Um, but again, it's eclipsing demonology. I had a case study. I you probably have heard this if you watch any of my shows. It's about a, a, a remote viewer who uh, was famous in his local town and he would go out of his body, he would beat his guides. And uh, he would have a password. And so if they knew the password and he knew the password, that's when they realized, okay, you're at the right place at the right time with the right beings. Well, one day he did everything according to plan, right? He checked all the boxes and he was in, this is going to sound like an abduction account. He was in a metallic room and these creatures, his guides had flanked him on the right and left sides. Mm. Uh, When he went for the password, they just looked at him. Like, what do you mean, password? <laughs> and so that's when he realized, wait a minute. These, these, they literally appeared as his guides. Same shape, same protocols, everything. Mm-hmm. Up until the mask had to be removed. Yeah, and this gets very dark very quickly, but I need everybody that's listening to pay attention to this. This will change your percept- perception of the phenomenon instantaneously. When they manifested as who they were, it was, it was so completely terrifying and inhuman that when he slammed back into his body, the son told me personally, he said, my father stumbled down the stairs. He was pale. He was crying and he couldn't talk. Mm. He had a massive heart attack, nearly died. When they got him in the hospital, they had to take his shirt off, put him in a robe and everything. As they were taking his shirt off from the subdermal level of the skin underneath the skin not the surface down from underneath to the surface these beings had carved from the inside out three religious amulets 
And they were able to determine that from yes, yes, from some kind of the, imaging. The, the picture, yes, I have photographs of it. But wow. the, but he but the son was being said Nathan he said because I did a lecture one time on symbolism and how these beings will carve things underneath people's eyelids. So he got a hold of that. He's like, you got to talk. So he said essentially that that there was a burning sensation that his dad described, and then they could see the shapes from underneath moving to the surface. Now here's what we have a problem with, and this is. I don't know. It's very interesting. Number one, one was a, uh, a a star of David from the Jewish faith. The other one was a cross from either Catholicism or Christianity. The one that disturbs me the most was an arching Egyptian hieroglyphic. Okay. Now, this soul to skin relationship is something that is pervasive in the field. The question that I've been wrestling with, because there's other data that suggests that they're doing it to the soul that's manifesting through the body, to the surface of the skin. Why are they playing by those rules? Hmm. We don't even play by those rules, right? You will right. not see a priest using Egyptian hieroglyphics to deal with entities. But what the, see, the rules they're playing by is so completely alien or different to our world that we're still trying to understand why would they do that? Now, can I go deeper with this? Is, is this freaking anybody out with? It's no, it's, nice everyone is loving this. It is, let's see, fleshy eyes with ghostly vision. Very interesting. <laughs> it, they say it's unfortunately not a one size fits all. And right. yeah, having that access is troubling. And let's see, the crazy thing that she's recently learned from working with entities and expelling negative energy since she was five, that is that every entity has a different weakness and a unique way to remove them. Do you find this to be the case? Yes. And unfortunately, there's no one size fits all answer like that individual uh, suggested. And, but, but even deeper, when we get into this soul to skin relationship, there's a case study uh, of UFO abduction or UFOs, but we don't know what they are yet. Uh, but uh, this individual was being plucked from her body at nighttime. Mm. And they would take her consciousness or her soul and they would do things to it, manipulate it. And when she got back into her body, then her skin began to manifest anomalies. Hmm. So See, are there I'm populations of people that are more affected by this, or is it pretty much just universal? Everybody, everybody, everybody. In that, and well, here's the most dangerous thing about it. We're basing our data on people who can remember. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We and some of these been... memories don't come until decades after Absolutely. the fact. Absolutely. I mean, th we're dealing with a very dangerous phenomenon here because, again, my suggestion was, it's, it seems simple, but it's profound. Where the data we're working with is based only on the people who remember their encounters. What about the millions who haven't? Right. So the data itself can largely be incomplete if we do not have the accurate size of the sample. Does that make sense? Yes. Is it big enough? Is it big enough? We don't know. Uh, but anyway, so the soul to skin uh, application to the day is very interesting. Even when you get into Ian Stevenson's work regarding the afterlife and past lives, uh, he was working with, oh my God, this gets really interesting. He's working with people who've claimed to have past lives and they have memories they shouldn't have. Now, according to his data, let's say you have Mary. Mary is an American. Mary works at a bank. Mary's is, Mary is married and has two kids. But in her mind, there's a memory of being a French woman eating baguettes in Paris. Yeah. Yes. This is, this is wild. And so in his research with Mary, Mary says, you know, this is my name. This is how I died. As a matter of fact, I died from a gunshot to the neck. Just so happens to be where Mary's birthmark is. Hmm. I love that you brought this up, Nathaniel. My daughter and I, we talk about this quite a bit and mm -hmm. she, she and I have, uh, we have birthmarks in quite a few different places. And, um, there have been different visions that I've had mm -hmm. both of her previous lives and of mine. 
And these birthmarks, they do coincide, coincide. in some yeah. very strange, uncanny ways that can be a bit uncomfortable to explore more deeply. But I, I would rather know. I would rather have that information. I'm re I feel really blessed that I've been right. given these visions because what's the alternative? Being in the dark to all right. of these feelings. Or, or even numb. That would be worse, right? Yeah. Completely numb to it all. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like I saw something and then I shut myself down because that was too much. Um, I think we we need yeah. to we need to progress with this element of bravery forward <laughs> as a human collective um, to learn as much as we can. And we're never going to necessarily know the entire spectrum of it. We obviously don't have the access that these entities have right. yet. But I mean, do you? I, I can see that that you're getting downloads now. Tell me more. Oh well, I can. I mean, I can talk for hours about this. Stuff. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, well, you know, where are they coming from? What do they know? How do they get their information? Because it's certainly not even. Um, so, so one hypothesis in the field was well, they just hack the brain. They read the mind of the person that's in front of them. That's not true either. Um, you know. So what are they doing? But this this hypothesis is very interesting. Uh, because the question arises, does the body look like the soul or mm. does the soul look like the body? Because another aspect of Ian Stevenson's research was that when Mary told him who she used to be, he would often find a picture of that individual. And there was almost a mirror to mirror similarity. Resemblance they reflect, between them. Resemblance, yep. Yeah. And they were... So they even looked alike. So this gets back into the idea of the afterlife uh, and pa having past lives. If there's a mirror to mirror resemblance, then, then we've got to start asking more important questions like, okay, does the soul affect the body in what way, right? Is the soul actually a mirror of the body? You know, that kind of whole thing I, I spoke about earlier, uh, but going even deeper, even when you get into hauntology, I've had cases where I had one case, I won't mention her name, but both her and her daughter were scratched in a, she was experiencing a malevolent haunting. And uh, at first, again, it's the same phenomenon where there was a burning sensation, but underneath the skin, mm -hmm. these scars and anomalies begin to manifest to the surface. The question has to be asked, are these beings affecting us on the soulish level? And then it's manifesting in mm. and through our bodies. Now, this gets back into a, a theory, an ancient theory of what's called ghost-born illnesses, where when a ghost possesses an individual, that, in, that individual will manifest through their body the same diseases that that ghost died of or that ghost suffered from mm. in life. This is why in demonology, at least in antiquity, uh, especially Isaac Luria in the 13th century, when he would lay hands on a person possessed, he would curse the sickness mm. by cursing the entity inside of that individual. This is also why in exorcisms, um, it kind of evolved, but their hypothesis was that if I can curse the entity and that leaves, then the sickness that it's causing in that individual will leave as well. And so that's when illnesses started to become entities. Got it. Got it. Interesting. And so it, it makes me jump back to those three symbols that you were discussing. It's almost as though religion or spiritual philosophy, whatever the most prevalent on the planet, as, as you had mentioned, was, is Catholicism. That's like a template for them right. to access to gain access into our consciousness because it's something that a very large amount of the human collective is ascribing to simultaneously which gives it power yeah. would you agree 100 percent, and that's another protocol of belief mm -hmm. there is something organic and spiritual about our species that it it manipulates and in order for it to manifest, it manipulates. Uh, for instance, Mariolatry um, within like Satanism and dark magic, Mariolatry was the right of taking an image of Mother Mary and defiling it 
Oh, wow. Now watch this. This is very important. None of that would have mattered if there wasn't a population out there that believed in the divinity of Mother Mary. Right. Absolutely. 100%. It's why the gods, the old gods, one of my favorite scenes from one of my favorite movies, Merlin, Queen Mab, right. the ancient one. Did you see it? Um, it's been, where, I was a kid when I saw it. Yeah, yeah she it. was so angry that everyone turned their back on her and she started to cease to exist. And it was like, it was kind of like the, the wicked witch of the, of the West or whatever, where you mm -hmm. throw the water and she, she just like melted away only she kind of just faded into thin air, but she had wreaked havoc on humanity for literal centuries prior to that, because everyone was ascribing their, their belief system to this, um, this deity and, and she mm -hmm. ruled by that fear. And that, that was where that power came from. So it makes me wonder if that fear is something of an important ingredient as well. If we are operating 100%. from that place of fear, when mm -hmm. we are saying, well, but I got a good feeling whenever this entity entered the room and it, it consoled me, if we are afraid, you know, that's a different layer that we are mm -hmm. working with rather than just looking at, well, I felt better. You know, that's there's, there there's different layers of the human consciousness that we need to explore deeply here. Mm -hmm. And that's one variable that is not always I, I think that's an access point. It's kind of like a, a chink in our armor, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. They're manipulating the human condition. Uh, I, I tell people in lectures like when we're dealing with Pizzozo and other demons, a lot of these demons were literally the creation. Now, this gets really interesting because it's like, okay, who created who here? Who conjured who? Because, uh, it, so let me tell you a story. One day, one day, a man in Mesopotamia was dealing with this haunting. He's just, oh my God, I can't get rid of it. I need help. I need help. I need a God. I need a deity. And so in his mind, he has an image of this demon or this God that he prays to an image in his mind. And so then he takes that image to a blacksmith and that blacksmith says, okay, now what image do you have in your mind? Well, this demon is this tall, this wide, and this is what I think his name is. And so the blacksmith, this is mentioned in the Bible in the book of Second Chronicles for the bibliophiles out there. But, okay, so then the blacksmith creates a material image of what was in that man's mind. Hmm. And then what that individual would do is he would take that idol, take it to his house, put it in the basement, kiss his wife, just good night, you know, tell his bedtime stories to his kids. Everything's great. Turns a light out, sets his alarm, goes to bed. And in the middle of the night, that idol begins to wobble. And the metal begins to be pushed out. And a hand stretches itself out and next thing you know an entity crawls out of that statue hmm. and guess what it looks just like the image it just came out of so the problem is long before the blacksmith yeah created that idol and molded that idol the entity in the ether had molded the mind of that man. Mm. Interesting. I wish to become incarnate, but you've got to make me. And then if you make me, then you will become the mortal portal in which I stretch my existence into this world. Back to Mariolatry. Do you believe in Mary? Yes. Okay. That's a, okay. Bam. Here's Mariolatry. Now I have an access point. Now, and what they were doing is these beings were going to hire magicians, magi, perform these rituals. Why? Because they believe in this now. We've got to, do. so, so there is, a, again, it's a protocol of belief, but this gets back into the CE5. Are you familiar with the CE5 movement? Absolutely, okay, okay. with Dr. Okay, Greer. a lot of people aren't. Yeah, uh, the CE5 movement is centered around, number one, if we have good intentions, they have good intentions. <gasps> right? Our intentions determine their intentions. Hmm. Really? Does that ever work with anybody else? I intend to get candy from a stranger. <laughs> Does he intend to get candy from me? 
the logic falls flat when we start to investigate it forensically. Now, the idea that I'm working with here is sure we can have people that go out there to conjure these beings, but that doesn't mean they didn't conjure you to conjure them. Got it. Who conjures who? Mm -hmm. And if we're dealing with creatures that are so intelligent, hyper aware, and I'll show you, but yeah, that's where we're at. <laughs> with more access to more of the spectrum of Correct. consciousness and like more than the spectrum of visible light, it kind of just uh, drives home for me. And here on my channel, Collective Connections with Zen Gen, what I like to do is I like to bridge the gap between many different schools of thought so that right. we can kind of get a comprehensive picture of what it is that we're dealing with in a, a cohesive understanding of all the moving parts, right? right. And it's interesting how you, you bring up that, um, so first off, the item, the thing that the blacksmith created. There's mm. also um, there's also power in architecture, right? Correct. Correct. There's power that is. It's almost like we enclose this energy into this space, and we mm. pool our energy into there like a church, and mm. that is what gives that that particular place this power. And mm -hmm. once the walls fall down, it's not necessarily that the power like it, that was enclosed is gone, but it does become more dispersed among right. other places. But it's it, you know that that particular site of power might still remain in some way, form, or fashion, kind of like Stonehenge, right? Correct. This, um, and, and it's also kind of speaks to what we're dealing with with respect to. Uh, the increase, exponential increase of technology with what we're dealing with, with AI, I feel a lot of these phenomenons are increasing with, and, and I, I feel like it is a, a direct uh, proportional increase with these other, um, these other increases in the, the human collective experience. And right. it, it's like what you said, that they can impersonate us Mm -hmm. that they, they can impersonate us after we transition they can impersonate us while we're alive and yeah. we're seeing the same thing play out in real time with ai and all of the capabilities that it you know that are revealing itself before our very mm -hmm. eyes it's like our eyes are no longer you know something that are it's going to fail us if that's all we're using to discern the difference between this and that right see we see with our vision right and what they've been doing is they've been appearing to our vision as a way to manipulate us mm -hmm. uh, in other words we have not been trusting our gut there's a secondary ability of ours to interpret the data to okay like you said oh, this doesn't Ooh, i don't want anything to do with it now my eyes may see a deceased person yeah right but what is using that as a mask and i've, I've done that with individuals i've especially with suicide i've been in front of people you know bam you mm. think it's this but it's actually suicide and when you get down to it then it had masked itself i had a case where uh it's at the dinner one night and I, I enjoy smoking cigars and reading and so one of my buddies it was just i was me it was my me time right just hanging out with myself <laughs> and uh, a buddy of mine comes up and says, okay, there's a, little, there's a girl that wants to talk to you about some situations in her life. And, you know, she heard about what you do. She's a good friend of mine. So I figured I'd introduce you. So I said, I said all right. So she heard her boyfriend sit across from me. I put my book down and she starts talking about how um, her best friend lived about 35 minutes away from us and how her, her best friend lived with her grandfather. The grandfather ran out of a house, his house by an entity was chasing him, breathing all hard. He had a heart attack and died in the lawn. And she said, now my best friend inherited that old house and she's afraid to go in and live there. And obviously who wouldn't be? Right. And so, and what's crazy is, so in this story that she gave me, there was a girl about her age and there was a grandfather involved. The grandfather was killed, at least led to die by an entity, chased out of his own residence hmm. 
So I'm talking to her and everything. And all of a sudden, I just feel the hair in the back of my neck stood up. And I feel this, you could see it in the second sight, this cloud descend down upon her. And I said, well, I said, I think there's a grandfather involved. And I think there's a girl your age involved. But I said, it's not your friend. I said, I can help her. And I will. But I said, as, as I'm talking to you right now, I said, suicide has attached itself to you and your relationships. Mm. I said, matter of fact, this relates with her boyfriend. I said, it's destroying this relationship right now. Wow. When I said that, tears started streaming down her face. Mm. She held her hand down. Now, this is home because I fought it as a kid. So I, it's crazy. But when, she, when I said that, she held her wrist out and she put two fingers, my, two of my fingers on her wrist. And I felt the scarification of that entity. Mm. She had split her wrist about a few months back. I said, all right. So I'm going down her life, just whatever. You know how you, you probably do it too. You, you pick up things and you've got inspiration. Now it's time to deal with the entity. And so I'm, I'm going in on that, that devil or whatever you want to call it. And when I got done, she was in her boyfriend's lap and she's weeping. That, that entity left. I said, all right. I said, now who is this grandfather? Now this event happened in 2017, I think. Her father, her grandfather committed suicide in 2014. Okay. So what it was doing, it was going down to the bloodline. Okay. This is why suicide runs in families is you're, you're positing this now. Right. And what modern science is, is having us believe is that, you know, maybe it's, it's some epidemic and it's, I, I feel yeah. like there's a major gaslighting that's happening to humanity in a lot of respects. And I'm not quite sure how much these institutions are in the know about it. Like that's a question yeah. for a different time and a different talk, but it's, it's interesting what it is you're positing it's an entirely different angle than it being like hereditary or it being something that is, you know, that, that, okay, well, this person passed away in this tragic way. And right. so it, it passes on that, that sorrow, like a ripple through the family. And that's like an epidemic. And that's not to say that that doesn't happen because I've experienced that, but there mm -hmm. could be like what you're ex describing an entirely different influence. That's totally Correct. more pervasive than all of these other hypotheses that we are entertaining as right. you know, the reason why. Yes, yes, uh, most certainly they're, they're playing a different, they're played by different rules because they're playing a different game. Mm -hmm. We have to think bigger, deeper, wider. Uh, certainly, I mean, with the Deborah Moffat case, uh, an individual who uh, they had all owned houses, they were renting them out, but they had a, a, a woman that would clean all the houses and she practiced Santeria. And I want to make sure I I say this right. She botched the ritual. I had somebody that practiced century to come after me for my head. Well, you say all, I didn't say that. She botched the ritual. And in the botched ritual, we got, how much time do we have? Yeah, a little bit oh, more time. We're wrapping up, but I, I mean, oh my goodness, I, I can, right. I can hang out for another 10, 10 to 15, okay. if you're available for that. Absolutely. So, so she botched this ritual. And by nature, anybody knows ritual magic, if the ritual is broken, what, what, you know, it doesn't work. Well, something came through the broken ritual. Mm. Something she did not plan for. Mm. And it manifested as a, you know, a ball of light. And when it did, it chased her out of her house. She went to the family and said, I don't know what just happened. But something came through. I was just trying to help the family. I think the, the grandmother was sick or something. Next thing they know, uh, Deborah Moffat wakes up in the morning, goes to use the restroom, looks at the mirror, and the entity had written with soap, give me a sacrifice. Oh, my. Yeah, so they had, uh, they had a bunch of people. They had a, who was it? I know Ed and Lorraine Warren went there. She had priests. She had Ed, Evelyn Puglini was there. If you guys heard her on Art Bell's show. Um, but the entity wanted a, a blood sacrifice, and he was a porting things in the house to actually you know perform this right one of them was a staff that that would just appear to the bed at nighttime and searingly cold they took it to a natural history museum it was dated to be about five or six hundred years old uh 
it was not used for hunting. It was used for blood rituals. Hmm. This entity wanted the soul and the life of the grandmother, mentioned her by name. And here's what he said. They, they asked, why do you want her? He said, because she is promised to me before she was born. Okay. Interesting. What are, what are we dealing with here? Because again, this does not fit into the blueprint of Catholicism. It's large. It's far larger. And that is an that is a common denominator. I know from my studies in anthropology that really all of you know throughout time in human history, that is one of the common denominators is blood sacrifice. There right. it, it, it ripples through like so many different continents, so many different cultures. Uh, blood sacrifice is a, a pervasive practice, whether you're talking about the Aztecs <laughs> or over in the old world, and it makes you kind of start to, you know, connect this dot to that one, you know, and, and, right. and it transcends uh, time as well from, you know, ancient human history to present day contemporary experiences, which is, is really like, I think that is the key in, you know, connecting the dots that of, of all of these question marks that it's raising is what are the common denominators. Right. And it's, it's, it kind of speaks also that we are in a, it, we are in a simulated reality sequence here on earth that for some reason, whatever reason, these accounts that you're talking about, these experiences that you've had with those that you've served as well as your own, that these entities are doing their damnedest, for lack of a better term, to enter into this simulation with us for Very good. whatever, awesome. right? Like that, and I've always believed that, um, since I heard this described, it resonated. People believe that our soul is inside of our body, whereas I believe our physical body is, is housed inside of our soul. This is right. really, I mean, this is supported in evidence from, you know, all of, you know, the chakra work, the energy field that's now measurable with instruments, that this physical human form that is discernible with the naked eye is only but a single little piece, a little facet of what our body actually looks like. And there's 100%. a lot of portal points that, you know, when we have those chinks in our armor that they can enter into and it manifests on the, on the physical plane. It manifests like you described from the inside coming out. But I feel as though the access point was through that energetic body first. Right. Would you agree? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, the body is the scaffolding to the soul. This is why mm. we have eyes. I like that. Right, we see without eyes. Scaffolding. I'm going to write that one down, I think. Yeah. That's a good one. <laughs> this is, yeah, this is why we, we see sometimes without our eyes. But yes. we see. We hear. I've, I've been in places where I've heard a conversation. I heard it, but... Not with my ears. Same. Uh, hold on. I felt something, but not with my hands. Right. So there but it is... mirrors. It mirrors right. the 3D senses. That's why Absolutely. they call it clear audience or clear sentience. Or Correct. you know, it's it's like it's like hearing, but you didn't hear it with your ears. You heard it in a different capacity. Absolutely. So exactly right. So what again. It's as if these beings are extracting, in many abductions, and even what are called demonic flights, they extract that unknown portion of our potentiality, mm. that which we are the most ignorant about, mm. in, into the most most of the population, to that that which we are unaware of. That's and it's, incredible. <laughs> right. And so, but we, yeah. Um, and I'll shut up. <laughs> no, I no. Time, but. I want to get to like, you're like, you actually had one of the comments that was say, hold on, let me find it. It was hilarious when I read it. Uh, she said, keep rambling. I love it. <laughs> uh, 
sir. You, we, everyone this, has enjoyed yeah. this conversation so much. Thank I'd you. love to have you on again, and we could we could yeah. go a little bit deeper into some of these concepts that I I really feel like we only skimmed the surface of Nathaniel. It's correct, um, correct. It, 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 like you said, we could talk for days about this. It could be an entire summit, you know. And and this, <laughs> I'd like that. Yeah. <laughs> The same person, Isabella, who's tuned in since the beginning, she said, is there a part two coming soon? I think that would be in the cards for us. I think that is called for. And 100%, yeah. I'm going to ask a couple of questions from our from those who've tuned in. We've had the same okay. folks tune in the entire time with us, Nathaniel, and I, I want them to get the chance to ask some questions of you before we hop off and end this live. Um, <laughs> Bobby Joe, she says to keep filming. <laughs> I wish that we could do this all day long. Um, let's see. So, um, pink man, Michael asks, are, are, so are symbols, are those the access points? Perhaps Ooh. what he's referring to is that, uh, that idol constructed by the blacksmith. Right. Well, when we're dealing with symbolism, uh, we're dealing with the simplification of language, the impartation of culture that is transcendent to us. So we, there's something there. Now we get into psychology. What we're dealing with is the iceberg effect. Iceberg effect. So when you're looking at the iceberg, that's the symbol. Mm. But but what it represents is underneath the water. Mm. Oh, something. Yeah. Do I? I said, oh, snap. <laughs> yeah, right, that's... because that's what we're seeing. Now, in Father Sinistrari's work, Franciscan priest, he was dealing with people who were being accosted by entities. And these entities, like serial killers, <coughs> were carving their symbols underneath their eyelids. Mm. So what, what we're ignorant of is, uh, see, that's called the imprint of culture. We see the imprint. We're ignorant of the culture. Now, yeah. again, if that's the case, then I'm, I, I'm led to believe that the imprint was not for us anyways. Oh, my God. It was for them. Because mm. to this day, we still don't know what it means. So if anything, their sexual pathology, their victimology, the way they treat humans is like a serial killer. I will mark bodies that are going to be buried. Why? It's, it's not just symbolism. It's the branding of a body. And here's my point. If we don't even know what that branding means, then it's not for us. It's for some other being or it's for that entity to look at the body and recognize that's mine. Interesting. Okay. So that, that brings me to like one more question. And this is my question. You're talking mm -hmm. about serial killers. I, I couldn't help myself. So whenever we are whenever we're dealing with an actual coined sociopath or psychopath, mm -hmm. Nathaniel, what, it, 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 where's the intersect here? Is there an intersect? Are these people not truly in control? Are they, are they possessed? Are they inhabited? Are they influenced? Is that what's happening? Many, many of them are. Uh, for instance, I have a good friend that was in contact with the BTK killer, Dennis Rader. Okay. And uh, Dennis Rader, they were exchanging numbers, not numbers, I'm sorry, letters. And uh, he would sign at the bottom of his letter to the, my, my friend, Rex, and he would draw a bunny rabbit. Hmm. Now, mind you, this man has no reason to lie. He's in prison for life. Yeah. Right? There's no, oh, my God, I'm innocent because of a demon. No. But when my friend confronted him about it, Dennis Rader told him, that's my demon. Hmm. What? So he had acknowledged, he'd done more than acknowledged, he had almost welcomed it into his... Every, everything I've done, every person I've killed has been for what? That demon. So these murders are sacrifices. Mm -hmm. Put that to the side. Jeffrey Gomer's favorite movie was The Exorcist. Prior to killing his victims, he would go into a trance and speak in tongues. Mm. His only living... Now, I'll wrap it up here in a second, but his only living victim was almost drugged. He tried to drug him with liquor. He went to the restroom, walked out. Jeffrey Dahmer swaying back and forth, speaking in tongues, watching The Exorcist. Now, not to say that every serial killer is like that, but when you're dealing with rituals, yeah, blood rituals, 
that that see that they would not have knowledge of yeah if they were not an expert in the ancient near east so who performed those rituals mm -hmm. anyways yes and the son of about. sam the son of sam he heard voices as well did he not 100 100 and the zodiac killer yeah i was about when, to say him too That's... when they finally cracked his code he said every soul that i've killed every person i've killed is going to be for the afterlife so what again what we're dealing with is, is these people have at least beliefs or knowledge of something that's beyond the veil and our ability you now and I'll, I'll this is my, my last point i make a promise there are three levels to knowledge there's the known the unknown and the unknowable we will not know the unknowable mm -hmm. we're still searching for the unknown and it's highly possible that this phenomenon has has, has layered itself to the point uh, that yeah they'll give us the unknown mm -hmm. but the unknowable will will forever be beyond our grasp yeah and i think though that there will be little tricklings little breadcrumbs along the way so to speak that mm -hmm. we're going to pick up on little by little we are in the procession of an equinox that is awakening us at an exponential rate and it's mm -hmm. it's revealing things that were previously hidden and it's also bringing to reconcile that which is you know from our history that we have been separated from and we have that amnesia as a collective and i believe that that amnesia as a collective mirrors the amnesia of individuals that sure. as individuals reawaken to their own purpose and their own visions and their own inter meanings for what it is that we are here for so mm -hmm. that up levels the collective consciousness and understanding the bigger picture and it's right. it's really going to shift paradigms as more of this unfurls and more is revealed and it's going to change how we conduct ourselves as humans in terms Correct. of how we deal with serial killers or whatnot, like, and, and how much is ascribed in, in terms of not just responsibility, but in the magnanimity of the crime. It's not necessarily going to be understood as like all on that person not right. to say that we we are not all autonomous and sovereign beings you know that you know we, we we do have to have some level of responsibility ascribed to us but the perspective is going to shift in how it is we right. deal with that i believe which is just fascinating to me i love mm -hmm. this material and i love where we went with it and i look forward yeah, to you chatting with you more nathaniel i've dropped Likewise. your late for the book, The Skin That Crawls, that you have authored. And I intend to get myself a copy. And I hope that everyone who is tuning in here live with us, there have been su such an amazing uh, handful of individuals that have tuned in live and have been on the edge of their seat, just like wow. I have through this conversation. So I hope all Thank of you. you will hop, hop into that link and grab your copy of The Skin That Crawls and everyone who joins us on the replay as well, because the, the, it seems like we're only scratching the surface of what Nathaniel J. Gillis has to offer here for <laughs> our collective connections to be made. Right. It's Thank you so much for having me on. And uh, yeah, The Skin That Crawls starts out with the nature of possession it bleeds into possession and pregnancy, and then we land right into the modern UFO abduction phenomenon. Mm, so it's so basically an, an anthology. You're hopping into lots of different right, paradigms bringing in Bringing it this. all together. Yeah, same phenomenon, Excellent. different masks. But uh, thank you all for tuning in, and uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you, thank you for having me on. I really I really appreciate that. Thank well. you. You are always welcome. Thank you for gracing our channel with all of you. You've illuminated a lot for us. And 
it, it seems like I, I, it's, it's becoming a lot more clear to me why it is I felt drawn to reach out to you after watching you. I, I didn't necessarily see eye to eye with everything that you right. were throwing down, but now I have an entirely new perspective and it's not like I disagree with anything that you said, but you've given me a different piece of the picture to look closely at. And I appreciate that it only enhances my vision. So thank you so right. much. Not a problem. Thank you for having me. You have a great day, Nathaniel. And thank you everyone for joining us live and for the replay for this amazing episode of Collective Connections with Zen Jen. Signing off.